Uh, thanks, Helen. I'd like to say thank you to GSQ for the very kind invitation to come and um, talk at this forum. I uh, visited the um, workshop in Townsville last time and really enjoyed it. So it's a real pleasure and privilege to be here and uh, present on behalf of Northern Territory Geological Survey. And I'd like to say thank you to Helen for the awesome title of the talk. When I was struggling for a title, Helen came up with this one. I said, that's a keeper. Let's go with that. Because over the fence, I mean, it's just a fence. The geology still continues. So just a quick overview of what the uh, NTGS is doing at the moment. We just received, oh, in the middle of last year, uh, the biggest initiative we've had to date, um, and that was based out of a review that was undertaken of our previous initiatives. Uh, we had some consultants come in and engage with, with industry to see what we were doing well and what we could do better. So we've got a few key focuses in our current initiative for the next four years. Um, it, we have a grant scheme which is very similar to the other um, geological surveys, which I won't talk about today. In fact, I'll only talk about the things in red. Um, we've got a program of upgrading the territory's coverage of geophysical data, which I'll talk a bit about. We've got a program unlocking the resource potential of the Barkley and Gulf regions, which I'll spend more time on because it's more relevant for this particular audience. Um, and a little bit on our stimulating greenfields exploration in Central Australia. We do a lot of promotion and I'll talk a tiny bit about uh, making the exploration geoscience data more accessible and again relevant to um, our area just across the fence. Uh, we, and in the review that we undertook about the condition of our geophysical coverage, whilst we're very fortunate, having started quite early, we've got excellent um, regional aeromagnetic and magnetic uh, radiometric coverage. Unfortunately, a lot of the key areas were acquired early um, in the piece of um, doing big regional surveys. So the data is not what we would consider up to modern standards. It's um, too broadly spaced and it hasn't been uh, flown with uh, differential GPS. So there's key areas that we're reflying um, in areas that are conducive to uh, magnetic data picking up the kind of stratigraphy and structure that you would like to see at that scale. So 200 metre line spacing, magnetic coverage over certain basement provinces <coughs> is the kind of program we're going to be doing and we encourage uh, industry in fill wherever possible. And the first program we've got doing that is in, so sorry, right to the other side of the border with WA, is in our, one of our three premier um, gold provinces in the Tanami. And we've just, uh, that data should be out hopefully next week. It was 200 metres line spaced um, data over the Tanami uh, with a considerable um, contribution from industry in filling to 100 metre line spacing. It was over 42,000 square kilometres. It's one of the biggest surveys we've done. So the next um, survey we have uh, off uh, magnetic and radiometric survey is continuing down to the southeast in the Aileron province, uh, which is um, a really uh, underexplored uh, polymetallic province. Uh, we're flying the uh, Mount Peak Crawford survey at the moment. That's again another 200 metre line space survey uh, with some industry infill to 100 metres. That's happening at the moment. Um, and all these surveys are being uh, managed by Geoscience Australia who undertake the QA and QC of the data, uh, for which we greatly appreciate. The beauty about doing this survey is there is a little link in between um, the two areas, between the, two, the Tanami survey and our Mount Peak survey, and that was co-funded uh, magnetic um, survey, or a mag survey that we did with IGO. So all that data will be available by mm, hopefully early next year. So we'll have seamless 200 metre line space coverage, in, coverage over that area. Um, we're upgrading um, the Territory's uh, gravity coverage too. Under our previous initiative, we went really hard and covered a lot of what we call the Greater MacArthur Basin, uh, improved the 11K spaced um, ground gravity to 4K or better. Uh, there's a couple of holes still left behind um, that need to be filled. One is down in the south, uh, southern Georgina, Davenport Range, sort of northern Aileron province area, which we're scoping, but we've had strong industry interest in uh, a gravity survey of the Tanami region. And um, we're always keen to hear from industry about where they'd like to see a better coverage, because that will um, determine where we spend our efforts in the shorter term. One of the challenges, of course, with ground gravity is um, having a land access <coughs> which we have a dedicated team to who are currently tied up a lot with um, doing exploring for the future work. But should industry feel that um, the Tanami is the place to be at the moment, then we will swing our resources there. Okay, moving more towards 
just across the border. Um, under the previous initiative, our core initiative, we had a big focus on the Greater MacArthur Basin. And that is an area that covers pretty much the a third of Northern, um, Northern Territory. Uh, and it's an area that is, uh, covers highly prospective stratigraphy, not only for uh, minerals, but for petroleum. So under our previous initiative, which was 2014 to 2018, we went really hard on trying to understand um, this thing that we call the Greater MacArthur Basin. And the concept was to link the outcropping MacArthur Basin in the north, um, the Birindudu Basin in the west, and the Tompkinson Province, which is the <coughs> extent of what people think of as the Tanami, uh, Tanami, the Tenant area. Now, we knew that the rocks were pretty much of the same age, but could we actually bring them together into uh, understanding of uh, a larger scale basin system? Some of the key data sets that uh, assisted in us um, being able to do this is um, the uh, large scale seismic that was shot by the petroleum company, so it's really handy having um, uh, sort of geology that is attractive to both the petroleum and the minerals explorers. So the intent was to understand the regional scale uh, stack basin architecture and unconformities using a variety of gravity acquisition, modelling, seismic interpretation and sea base. And um, we were, wanted to understand the um, potential mineral and petroleum systems, so we did a lot of fluid flow modelling and characterisation for the source rocks for the petroleum systems. Uh, one of the major things we did uh, was commission a sea base study over the Greater MacArthur Basin. You can see the old 2006 uh, on the right, and then the more recent 2018 version. I think Karen Connors is in the room somewhere. So that was, uh, that was Karen's <coughs> hard work when she was at Frog Tech. Um, this was a highly successful study. What we weren't able to do was incorporate the new seismic um, that was acquired through Geoscience Australia and Exploring the Future that crossed um, the Northern Territory and Queensland border. Uh, Queensland also commissioned a frog tech um, sea base project <coughs> just across the border. So we are now um, going to commission a new uh, sea base project to make that um, connection seamless. We'll also be, we'll also be um, uh, <coughs> commissioning a sea base project over the whole of the Northern Territory, but the first focus is to upgrade that uh, Greater MacArthur Play Basin and make it seamless across the border with Queensland. Uh, one of the other uh, big focuses for us in the MacArthur Basin, we had a, um, a collaboration with uh, CSIRO where we had two uh, postdoctoral research fellows embedded in NTGS um, to look at specifically the Batten Fault Zone, which of course hosts uh, the MacArthur lead sink uh, de mine and the Tina deposit. And the idea was to acquire a um, much more higher, much more higher resolution um, gravity to be modelled to understand a solid geology interpretation and fault architecture of that, of that uh, Paleoproterozoic geology, mainly so we could understand um, what the fault <coughs> architecture was in terms of creating the sub-basins that host these major deposits. If we understand that architecture better, we can understand the, pros the perspectivity of each particular sub-basin in its own context. Um, so Tegan Blakey, uh, who was the postdoc embedded researcher at, at the time, she's now with CSRO uh, full-time, undertook a very detailed um, modelling of that area. So we've got solid geology in terms of, of the Batten Fault Zone using these um, forward modelling of, of some high-resolution gravity profiles. We also, the other embedded researcher undertook a really um, high-resolution logging, consistent logging within a sub-basin to understand um, not only the facies changes, but to find a tool that we could promote as a tool by which you could understand where you were stratigraphically. When you were drilling, how would you know where you are in that stratigraphy? And carbon isotopes happened to be the tool that he found that was most useful. So um, a lot of this work has been published uh, through our ages abstracts, but the final report pulling all this together, including the deformation <coughs> flow modelling, will be released by the end of the year. So some of the key take-home messages from that uh, area, and it, it, you know, it applies the rocks that we're talking about now, of course, extend further east and, to a degree, further west. Um, the principles are the same. The Batten Fault Zone just happens to be the area in, within the <coughs> territory that has the most um, structural impact on these uh, highly prospective source rocks, um, be they for minerals or for petroleum. So some of the major findings out of that um, whole collaboration project, that some of the key growth faults controlling mineralisation are often blind at surface. And you can see that if, if anyone's been to um, 
the talk by Tech on their Tina deposit where they show the um, seismic, you cannot see those um, key faults coming at surface. Now also that anomalously thick sequence of mafic volcanics in the Twala group in the Paleoproteozoic have a strong spatial association to known mineralisation. That whilst it was implied probably conceptually, we've, um, there's more data to suggest that now. And that a short-lived compressional event at the end of the deposition of the 1640 Barney Creek Formation may be the tectonic driver for the uh, fluid flow and diagenic mineralisation. And that carbon isotope stratigraphy was a powerful tool for regional uh, correlation. So this uh, combined project that was done by CSIRO we hope will be out by the end of the year. Another key thing that we needed to do as we're trying to understand how the um, structural controls in this very regional scale basin, how they were controlling the basin architecture through time because we are looking at a stack basin or probably a series of stack basins if you want to include the Neoproterozoic. So um, fortunately for us, the um, area known as the Bilu Subbasin uh, is um, a bit of a pin-up child for the petroleum industry at the moment and we, there was uh, extensive seismic over that particular area so we undertook a detailed seismic interpretation so we could understand the structures that are controlling um, the mesoproterozoic deposition and whether they are also being seen to control any of the um, structures in the paleoproterozoic which is probably which is more uh, prospective for the minerals industry but still also prospective for the petroleum industry. So that was uh, released and um, completed. The process of, of how we did the depth conversion of the seismic, um, we're going to release a record on that because, believe you me, the boundary of the Beetaloo Subbasin is a fairly controversial beast. Um, <coughs> and it, so that was what we were trying to do. We were trying to, under our previous initiative, to really kind of unravel this highly prospective, really large regional scale area, but a a real carbuncle, um, as undealt with business, was the uh, South Nicholson and Lawn Hill platform area down in that southwest, south east, um, which of course again continues on into the Queensland geology. So whilst we drew a, a sort of a vague boundary <coughs> of what we called the Greater MacArthur Basin, small g, because we had enough data to understand that these were connected. Uh, these outcropping areas were connected. We didn't have that kind of information for the South Nixon and Bourne Hill platform stratigraphy, which are equivalents to um, equivalents across the border and up into uh, the MacArthur region. So, uh, thanks to the work um, taken by uh, GS Australia under Exploring for the Future, there's been a massive amounts of new data, including the South Nicholson seismic, <coughs> which we've now been able to understand those systems better. What we'll do as part of this exercise to understand the relationship between the South Nicholson and the um, small G Greater MacArthur Basin is we'll be undertaking um, mapping of the key map sheets in that area, trying to resolve the stratigraphy and the structure at surface and relate that to the seismic that's been interpreted. Uh, GS Australia will also be undertaking quite a lot of source, source rock geochemistry and characterisation to understand the petroleum system in that area. We did a lot of work in the um, Greater MacArthur Basin. Geoscience Australia will take on the role in the South Nicholson. Um, under the Geoscience Australia's Exploring for the Future um, program in the Barclay region, I presume probably people from Geoscience Australia who I see up back there probably talking about it later, um, there's been an unprecedented amount of new geoscience data um, across from Mount Isa to Tennant Creek. Um, and the, it's, um, it's really been transformational, certainly from the Northern Territory's point of view, in an area where there is so little data that there has been such an intensive collection of data in this particular area where you can link known mineral provinces together. So you know the geology is good, you just don't know how to target undercover. And we see a strong um, potential for undercover mineral province east of Tennant Creek that no doubt will head east to the... We only wish we had a Mount Isa right on our border. Anyway. Um, so what's happening going forward under our new initiative and through Geoscience Australia's Exploring for the Future? Uh, there's been um, just finished a higher resolution gravity uh, survey which has tied into our higher resolution as uh, being into GS's Batten Fault Zone, uh, two kilometre gravity. Um, there's a southwest MacArthur gravity in that sort of orangey colour. Um, that links across where we understand uh, outcropping, prospective geology, undercover and across to the west. 
there's going to be a new seismic acquisition program, which I think has commenced this week. Um, that's the red line that's crossing out my acquisition. <laughs> um, that's a major new um, seismic data acquisition, which parallels, I think, continues on from GSQs. You, you comes across, yes. So we are getting again that um, <coughs> very nice uh, imaging across uh, this geology from east to west. And for us, this is going to link up for across the um, mineral province, the undercover mineral province of Eastern Tennant, and up into the Beelu, um subbasin. So, for the first time, we'll be able to image that kind of uh, geology subsurface. And ultimately, um, oh, gee, my little symbol has gone all over the shop. Um, next year, under the Menic CRC, there will be stratigraphic drilling in that sort of um, dotted grey square between Tennant Creek and the. Um, Queensland border. So, not only will there be has there been a massive amount of um, new data collected, and I'm presuming the GA guys will talk a lot about that, um, but there's also going to be the truth tube will go down uh, next year, and we'll see what um, what the drilling determines based on the modelling from the geophysics. Now, that's all um, Geoscience Australia's work, and we're helping and co-funding and collaborating where possible. But this is um, Geoscience Australia's exploring for the future program. What we are doing in the NTGS is um, we're trying to um, sort of work in areas that complement what Geoscience Australia is doing, but enhancing um, areas that are probably more brown, brown fields to khaki fields. So whilst um, the East Tenant area is undergoing massive amounts of data collection because it is so data poor, for us we have a different program in the Tenant and Arova mineral fields. And that involves a lot of the uh, capture of all the historic and drilling geochemistry data, especially in the, in the tenant mineral field where they've had a long history of gold exploration. And based on what I was seeing at um, the uh, workshop last week, we're commissioning the um, Rick Valenta's group um, to do some um, mineral atlases for uh, all the major deposits in the tenant mineral field and the rover mineral field with um, some 3D visualisation products. In producing exploration toolkit. The challenge for us with the tenant mineral field, and we've had some excellent explorers working in that mineral field, is that uh, we and they, everybody wants to move beyond the paradigm of the uh, Tenant Creek IFCG and look for a bigger system. Now, Emerson, Emerson Resources have done some excellent work and has some amazing joint venture partners, but it's not cracking the nut. So um, at this stage, we did a big audit on, is there any new data that we could collect in that area? Um, that might help and really with discussions with Emerson they've pretty much done an awful lot of work. So the best idea now is to pull it all together so people can actually see how that geology is working. So that's what we'll be doing in the Tenant Mineral Field. Uh, the Rover Field to the west is a really interesting one and we're going to do more new data in that area because it's the it has similarities but differences to the tenant mineral field. The tenant mineral field is close to surface and exposed. The rover field down to the southwest is undercover. So in the tenant mineral field also um, we'll be building, similar to what GSQ is doing in the northwest mineral province, we'll build a much more scale we're doing on, a physical and virtual representative drill core collection for the tenant mineral field. We'll be talking strongly with industry about working out which are the key drill cores that represent uh, the mineral systems in there. We're currently high logging all the tenant mineral field drill core that we have in our repositories and making that available and building a tenant mineral atlas, spectral atlas. Um, we're systematically collecting all the um, rock property data that's already been reported to us, but collecting it when we have uh, drill core submitted or a drill core in our current collection. And we've done a uh, collation uh, and ultimately we'll grid all the open file geophysics, industry geophysics over that area. Again, there's been, because of the history of exploration there, there's some really high resolution um, data sets that we want to bring together so people can hit the ground if they ever want to get involved in the tenant field running uh, and have as much information at their fingertips as possible. The rover field <coughs> to the southwest again uh, is undercover. The really interesting thing about the rover field is that it has known mineralisation, it has um, deposits. Uh, the Rover 1 is under about two, couple of hundred metres uh, cover. It's a Warrego equivalent. It's a classic Tenant Creek copper gold style. But further to the west is a lead zinc system that nobody really knows anything about. Um, lead zinc uh, and a copper system. So what we're going to do is undertake a systematic look at from the drill core from this area 
and try and understand the host sequence and the structure to see what kind of this mineral system this is to the west. It would be pretty awesome for the Tennant Creek region if they, we could find something, or not find, if we come up with an understanding of whether we're, there is a potential for a much bigger system than some of these boutique style um, Tennant Creek uh, copper gold systems. So Castile, who's done a lot of the work out there on Explorer 108 and Curiosity, um, their interpretation is that the Explorer 108 is a, a lead zinc rich end member with the Curiosity um, prospect located closer to the feeder structure, um, more proximal, but <coughs> and being a copper rich component of the same system. So we'll just we'll be doing a lot of dating and uh, characterization of the host stratigraphy and all the isotopic systems to understand how that's working and maybe even bring up try and develop a 3D model, if I can talk Rick into it. Uh, just quickly, <coughs> we're doing other work in um, Central Australia, much more related to mapping and understanding the geological framework. Um, in the Aleron province, it's our polymetallic province, it usually um, concerns people, although Simon's been out in Ger way back in the day, haven't you? So um, there is... Uh, known and well exposed um, polymetallic uh, mineral systems at surface or close to surface. We're going to characterise them but also do a compare and contrast as you move further west where these systems may be undercover. A lot of that work's been done and we're just in the process of writing it up and getting it out there. But the take home message is that there's a lot of syngenetic deposits um, between 1825 and 1780. These are typically associated with mafic to bimodal magnetism and exhalates in classic sediments. Uh, the recent discoveries by IGO down uh, in the southwest Aleron province near the um, WA border, the Grapple and Hendrix, um, these are, appear to be epigenetic or remobilised syngenetic deposits. And we have some work on the Amadia space and focusing on the neoproterozoic neo stratigraphy <coughs> and developing a 3D base and architecture. For us, the frustration of the Amadia space is yes, it's got petroleum, but surely it's got mineral potential as well. So. The first step is to us to better understand the architecture, to look at some of these feeder structures that might be going to volcanics underneath that we may be able to have a better understanding of what the potential might be for mineral systems. And just quickly, um, we're also doing a major campaign to upgrade our uh, anti-wide drilling and geochemistry data sets. Um, we've got a um, strategy of inputting, you know, ongoing input of incoming data that's being reported to us, but a major legacy data capture at the moment. We did the um, Batten Fault Zone in the previous initiative, but we're now moving to the Tennant and Barclay um, under the current initiative to bring all the geochemical data and drill, drill hole data uh, available in a database and easy to find, discoverable. So just in summary, um, we've got a diverse range of projects um, to stimulate exploration of the NT through this initiative. Uh, I would say, in combination with exploring for the, uh, the future, this has been the biggest campaign of collaborative, pre-competitive geoscience in the Territory's history. Uh, and I, I personally say I've been in a, a survey for 23 years, and it's, um, it's, we've never been at a point where most of the surveys and the federal and the state and territory counterparts are working so well together. Our objective is to um, make the geology seamless and accessible <coughs> and of an equivalent standard and to provide the data sets and the challenge for us is to provide the data sets as quickly as possible um, for the exploration industry to use. So thank you.